So um, the starting point for my paper is uh, this painting by Paul Delaroche, The Assassination of the Duke de Guise, um, which he showed at the Salon of 1835. It apparently had a remarkable effect on salon goers who clamored to get a view of it in the crowded conditions of the exhibition. People were apparently very taken with the eyewitness effect of the scene and the sense that you feel as if you've just happened upon the aftermath of an assassination. The striking reality effect of the picture seemed to rest on its unusual composition. So normally in a history painting, you would expect the focus uh, to be on the human figure as the primary vehicle through which meaning was conveyed. So the figures were expected to dominate the picture space, but here they were proportionally small and the whole human drama was relegated to the edges of the composition. Um, the focus seemed to be as much on the decor and on the space of the room as on the human component. And this gave it an accidental feel as if the viewer had just happened upon the scene. Um, but these same qualities presented a problem for many critics in that for them, the picture seemed to lack a moral center. Um, did Delaroche think it was a good thing that Guise had been assassinated or not? They weren't sure. Um, they acknowledged that the painting was highly illusionistic, but they thought that it lacked a clear message or in fact, any message at all. So in this paper, I want to deal with um, the question of how the eyewitness effect of the picture was achieved. And also with this criticism made at the time by those who felt that it lacked a message, that it presented a beguiling illusion, but that it was devoid of conceptual content. So I need first to give you um, some information about the subject matter. The painting shows an episode from the French Wars of Religion, the assassination in 1588 of the Duc de Guise on the orders of the King Henri Trois at the Chateau of Blois. Guise had challenged the authority of Henri Trois and the King who was in fear of Guise's power and popularity ordered his assassination and De La Roche shows him peering in to see that his orders have been successfully carried out by his courtiers. With its disregard for compositional norms, the picture may seem set apart from uh, De La Roche's other major history paintings, which are more obviously looped through the repertoire of past images. However, although the Duke de Guise was indeed startlingly original, um, I want to show that it does, like his other major salon paintings, refer to a previous history of images. So to reconcile the apparent contradiction of an image that seems unmediated, but which nevertheless rests on the viewer's familiarity with the art of the past, I want to consider remediation, um, a theoretical framework developed to analyze new media, um, such as photography, cinema, virtual reality. And this is the idea whereby each new media creates the effect of transparency or immediacy by absorbing, revising, and claiming to improve upon the previous technology. So in other words, while honoring certain aspects of the source, the new image appears to improve upon it and correct it in this way, seeming to lift the veil of mediation altogether. So some of the aspects of uh, De La Roche's painting that critics regarded as bizarre or surprising appear in fact to be adapted from 17th century prints of Guise's assassination. Um, a series by Franz Hogenberg, for instance, reveals several points of comparison with De La Roche's picture. Um, the inclusion of the ceiling and the floor, both articulated by geometric patterns, create a perspective box that anticipates the oblong space of uh, De La Roche's painting. The fireplace to the left also corresponds to the painting. Uh, this feature may relate to the story that following the assassination, 
Giza's body was burnt in one of the huge fireplaces um, at Blois, and his bones then are thrown into the Loire in an attempt to deprive his, uh, his supporters of relics. Also, while critics of the Duke de Guise, the painting, remarked on the small size of the figures relative to the composition as a whole, this too is a feature of contemporary prints. Um, similarly, while de La Roche's attention to the details and furnishings of the room in which the action takes place was deemed inappropriate in serious painting. The engraving includes the same kind of redundant details, for instance, in the furniture ranged along the back wall and covered over with tapestries. Following the logic of remediation, Delaroche absorbs but also revises the source image. Certain aspects of uh, the print is, um, certain aspects are honored um, but in other respects, the painting offers a kind of corrective. So the monochrome hatching and stippling of the engraving are replaced by the color and high focus illusionism of oil paint. But the room also becomes deeper, its perspective more convincing. The strict symmetry of the engraving gives place to a decentered composition, which appears more accidental and less contrived. Finally, in place of Hogenberg's evenly spaced figures ranged across the composition as in a frieze, Delaroche uh, shows the moment after the assassination, a cluster of courtiers to the left, the prone figure of Guise to the right, and empty space in between. So to some extent, this is a case of increasing the illusionism of the picture, but other alterations to the model that have the effect of changing and subverting the message of the original. Hogenberg shows Henri Toi as a dignified figure presiding over the action and taller than the other participants. Delaroche, like Hogenberg, places him to the left of the composition near the fireplace, but shows him stooping, only daring to enter the chamber once his courtiers have convinced him that it's safe to do so. As with the revisions operated on the more innocent aspects of the setting and decor, the effect of this alteration is to suggest to the viewer that while yes, the details of the engraving may be broadly correct, the painting in fact tells the true story. A further visual source uh, for the Duc de Guise is an engraving of the same episode after uh, Jean-Francois de Troyes, um, this is the painting um, after which the engraving was made, um, which is one of the illustrations to Voltaire's epic poem, The Henriade of, of 1723. So again, we're presented with a room positioned parallel to the picture frame. And here, as in Delaroche's painting, we see a curtained doorway giving onto an unseen space to the left. The elegant stance of the figure observing the action with his back to the viewer is also suggestive of De La uh, insouciant courtiers. The geometric tiled floor again anticipates De La painting and even the shaft of light from an unseen window to the right in the Duke de Guise um, appears to be taken from the Troy's example. The upper part of the illustration is similarly given over to um, the decorative details of the room. So decorative uh, putti seated on the entablature in Detroit's image are transposed um, to the mantelpiece in uh, De La Roche's painting. In, De La Roche, in Detroit's illustration, these stone figures offer a critique of the action below. The large reclining figure looks away, indifferent to the violent scene taking place below. Uh, while the putti are engaged in a, a game of tug with, with the stone garlands, which can be understood as an ironic commentary on the power struggle taking place below. And this critique of the human drama is in keeping with the satirical tone of Voltaire's epic poem. Now in Delaroche's painting, Detroit's playful putti become the figures of two uh, kneeling boys above the mantelpiece who appear to lean in to view the scene below. Um, however, the visual rhyme between the crucifixion on the back wall of De La Roche's painting 
and Guise's posture suggests a quite different set of associations. Now, this is actually rooted in historical record since following Guise's murder, his supporters compared him to Christ. Um, so by adopting the structures of the source image while appearing to correct and revise them, the artist seems to claim that while the previous stereotype may have been biased in certain ways, it nevertheless contains within it um, a germ of truth and that by clearing away all that is supposedly inauthentic in that image, the original event may be revealed um, in its pristine state. So far, I've been looking at art historical sources for the painting, but in the second half of this paper, I want to touch on its relationship to a near contemporary drama. Um, Stephen Bann has argued convincingly for a relationship between the painting and this play, uh, Alexandre Dumas' Henri Toi Sacour, which premiered at the Théâtre Francais in 1829. Now the connection is set, is based on a set of drawings by De La Roche, which I will come to in a moment, which without being a record of the performance as it would have looked to an audience member, are clearly um, a response to this production. So Dumas play concerns the same characters as those in De La Roche's painting, but at an earlier point in the story. Um, the political power struggle between Henri Toi and Guise is the backdrop for a revenge plot um, of Dumas' invention, in which um, the Duc de Guise sets out to murder his wife's lover, uh, Sam Megrin, who is one of the favorites of Henri Toi, the king. And Guise's plot is laid in act three, in which he coerces his wife into writing a letter to lure Saint-Megrin to a rendezvous by almost breaking his wife's wrist in his iron gauntlet, which is what you see here in um, De Veria's lithograph. So I think the relationship of the painting to the plays is not so much one of revision as I've been arguing the respect to the art historical sources for the picture. Um, rather, I think that Delaroche adopts a similar strategy to that of Dumas in the play, which is to emphasize the strangeness of the past through a combination of vivid, um, but somewhat exotic material detail and a certain um, strangeness or opacity in terms of the psychology driving the action. So the life of the court as portrayed uh, by Dumas uh, was felt to be fascinating, but lacking in any useful lesson. Um, since um, the power struggle is between two equally flawed protagonists. Uh, the king is fatally weak in the play, but then Guise is presented as a brutal bully. And in the same way, you know, art critics didn't know whose side De La Roche was on. It was a fascinating scene, but, but seemed to lack a moral center. Both the play and the painting were compared by respective critics to the historical chronicle, um, which is a historical text, but one that um, lists facts rather than offering an evaluation. And I think those comments were picking up on this combination of piquant detail and psychological impenetrability. Dumas also employs um, jarring contrasts of mood uh, that seem shocking to 19th century spectators. And I think that this is also a feature of uh, the painting. So for instance, um, the play is set in uh, what was regarded as the feminized court of Henri Toi, in which the king is surrounded by his minions or favorites. And the gravity of the action that takes place between Guise, his wife, and Saint Megrin was undercut by the frivolity of the minions who were shown engaging in uh, playing with games of cup and ball and, and playing with pea shooters. Uh, there was also an emphasis on the occult in the play. Uh, this is a page from one of the surviving prompt copies. Um, 
showing a sketch of the opening scene, which takes place in an astrologer's chamber with all of his um, devices and, and telescopes from reading the stars. So in this way, um, Dumas calls attention to beliefs and behaviors uh, that to a 19th century spectator would have seemed strange or unfamiliar. The final act takes place in the Duchess's chamber to which uh, Saint Magrin has been lured by Guise's trick. And this is the act that Delaroche seems to have been most interested in. Uh, Saint Magrin arrives at the rendezvous. The Duchess warns him straight away and uses her arm to bolt the door against Guise and his men who are hammering away at the door while Samagram makes his escape through a window, but it's too late because Giza's men are, they're downstairs in the street and you, you, hear, you hear the murder take place rather than actually see it. Um, so these are Deloroche's uh, sketches showing successive moments of that final scene. And um, so the two most sensational scenes were this one, and the domestic violence scene of act three, which I, I showed before the lithograph by de Veria. And in both cases, the violent act is staged in an intimate, private, somewhat feminine setting, um, which made it all the more shocking for audiences. Um, and of course, uh, Deloroche too sets the murder in a bedchamber. And in a more general sense, the play was felt to offer a jarring juxtapos juxtaposition of moods. So in fact, many critics felt that it was in fact two separate dramas awkwardly spliced together. Um, on the one hand, as implied by the title, there was a chronicle of the feminized and frivolous court of Henri Troy, while on the other there's the tragic love story between Saint Magrin and the Duchess de Guise. And these two kind of were thought to not fit together particularly harmoniously. The surprising effect of the effeminate minions in Dumas' play seems to be picked up by Deloroche uh, in the unexpected affect of some of the protagonists in the painting. So critics were struck, for instance, by the easy grace of uh, the assassins in Deloroche's painting moments after their brutal attack. Um, so as one critic wrote, um, respectable people, who know how to uh, stab a man to death without turning everything upside down in the apartment, uh, without littering the floor with debris, without even disturbing the perfection of their toilette. Um, so there's another sense in which the jarring contrasts of the play reappear in the painting. For instance, several critics felt that the mood of the picture, the impression it gave at first sight was somehow at odds with the seriousness of the action. Um, the reviewer for Le Constitutionnel claimed to have been completely wrong-footed by the painting. Um, he expected it to depict at first sight an entirely different type of subject. So this is his comment, um, at first seeing only the elegance of the ornaments, the brilliance of the fabrics, and the finesse and coquetry of the tones, one would believe that one had entered a boudoir where some tender marquise de petit super is writing a perfumed note while complaining of her headaches and nerves. But on looking closer, he was surprised to find neither perfumes nor love letters nor coquettes migraine, but a good and grand assassination. And another critic uh, wrote that, um, it's certain that this manner of painting, so fine, so melting, so precious, does not suit the subject. So here too, we have this, um, juxtaposition of frivolity and femininity against violence and masculinity. So critics in 1835 appear not to have noted a connection with Dumas' Henri Trois, but I think we can see a common strategy of emphasizing the strangeness of the past. And this idea of the past as separated from the present moment by an insuperable gulf is a particularly modern idea. And so this this strategy renders it all the more tantalizingly real for a modern 19th century spectator. So I mentioned that critics of the painting in 1835 didn't know whose side Delaroche was on. So were those critics 
correct who thought that the painting offered merely a seductive optical illusion. It seems to me that what's really innovative about this painting is that Delaroche is able to embed the emotional import of the work within a painting that nevertheless appears haphazard and unarranged. So for us, perhaps, the visual rhyme between the crucifixion on the back wall and Giza's slumped body suggests a rather obvious narrative of martyrdom. Um, but none of the critics in 1835 noted it, despite the fact that it was actually traditional to associate uh, Gies with Christ. Neither did they comment on the shaft of light striking Gies's body from an unseen window. That's the detail that seems to be taken perhaps from Detroit's illustration, but which here has a kind of transfiguring effect, um, further separating Gies's body from the realm of the living, the crowd of conspirators to the left. And it seems to me that this is a painting about martyrdom, but it's, it's interesting that many critics in 1835 were unsure about Delaroche's attitude to Guise, and I would suggest that that may be because his pictorial strategy was in fact so, so, so new at the time. So thank you. We have a question, uh, excuse me, uh, from uh, Susan Ziegfried. Wonderful evocation of Delaroche's strategy. Can you see it operating in other painting, paintings by him? Um, yes, thank you, Susan. That's a great question. And uh, I mean, yes, I think my, my answer is yes. I think I think that particular painting by Delaroche is often seen as a case apart from paintings like um, the execution of Jane Grey, for instance, which is much more much, much more obviously looped through British, um, you know, British historical prints, for instance, and was remarked upon at the time. Critics said at the time that they more or less accused him of plagiarism. So I think art historians have tended to look at the assassination of the Duke de Guise as sort of like a case apart, because as if it's not doing the same thing. But I think I'm arguing that yes, I, like his other major salon paintings, he uses this strategy of remediation, which is to kind of resting on the familiarity of of the viewer with um, existing imagery, but to kind of absorb it, revise it, correct it, alter, alter the message in a way that for some viewers seems, um, seems transparent. It kind of makes, it's a, it's a strategy of erasure, um, even though it rests on that, that kind of basis of previous images. So that's, that's what I was trying to say about that. Um, the strategy seems to lodge though on his smaller, on his smaller genre canvases. Um, um, sorry, do you want to, um, can you clarify that one, Susan? I'm not quite sure what, what you mean there. Uh, Susan, you you can answer your question. <laughs> There's a, a tight version. Uh -huh. um, I'm thinking of the, the this wonderful evocation of the the finesse, the melting style, uh -huh. the yeah, um, okay. all of this seems to sort of take over. Uh, in the smaller canvases, I'm thinking of the two Wallace pictures in particular. Yes. Whereas with yeah. Jane Grey, you sort of have a contrast of brilliant fabric against a kind of large dark ground on this historical scale or the Jeanne d'Arc. So, but in these, these uh, sort of modestly sized, mid-sized canvases, it seems to be all detail as if he doesn't quite know what to focus on or what to, to pick. I find it hard to, to focus in those, in those paintings. And so would be sympathetic to critics at the time saying, what's the moral? 
yes, what, whose side is he on is was what they were saying. And you can kind of right. understand, yeah. you know. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I get your point now. Yes, I think um, that particular strategy of juxtaposing a kind of a precious kind of style with a brutal subject, I think is something that you see in particular in, in, right. in the death of Mazaran, where you've got, you know, kind of deathbed scene and this kind of, right. in, in the yeah. kind of intimate, precious setting of this kind of bedchamber. And also the kind of, the oddness of having, a, you know, a deathbed scene where it's full of people having a party. <laughs> um, that kind of right. <laughs> psychological strangeness of the, the jarringness of the setting and what's going on that that kind of strike that kind of the past is strange yes I think yeah I, I I agree with that I think those those pictures in a way belong um belong together in that sense um yeah I mean it's interesting because people that particular pe picture people having seen Jane Grey the previous at the previous salon the crowd were, were rushing to see this one I think, as one critic said, eager to see if, if the emotions they felt would be the same as they'd experienced having seen Jane Grey. So there was a mm. kind of clamour mm. and, you know, people risking life and limb to get a look at this thing. But then I think this one was even, it was, I mean, that one was a, a, a kind of original picture, but this one, I think people apparently walked away silent and gloomy, not quite knowing what to make of it so I think it was I mean I think what I'm saying is yes it is that kind of detail and where do you look and I think in particular the, the use of light which seems like a kind of accidental lighting effect like like you'd get in you know in a cold Leon type interior but I think used here to narrative effect in a way that I think is quite new and what I've been looking at is you know can you see that kind of focused light used to narrative effect in the theatre and I don't think you can at that point. I think it, it's mid-century before you can use, before you have kind of, you know, limelight and, and that kind of technology to, mm. to throw focused light and create this kind of sense of a transfiguring effect. And I'm wondering if maybe people just didn't, he's doing something there, but people didn't quite know how to understand it, or the critics at least, or how mm -hmm. to articulate mm -hmm. what, what that experience was like looking at it. So yeah, thanks for, that's, that's a great question. Thank you.